Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Catholic Truth Podcast, where we teach and preach the Catholic faith that comes down to us from Jesus and the Apostle over 2,000 years. We want to help you to know your faith, love your faith, live your faith, and even be able to defend it. And even weekly, we have people coming home to the Catholic Church because of our ministry from other faiths, and even ex-Catholics who are returning back to the Catholic Church. So praise God. In this video, we have an excellent topic. I mean, this is one of the most awesome topics that I've spoken, I've read about and talked about in a while, and it's how Sola Scriptura has basically destroyed the world. It's made Christianity worse, it's made religion worse, and it's made our society worse. Now, that is an audacious claim, but today we have a very special guest who wrote a book called Twisted Unto Destruction and How the Bible Alone Has Made the, the World a Worse place. And so I want to welcome to the show Don Johnson, who is a filmmaker, an author, and a speaker. He has a BA in the Theology, Missions, and Intercultural Studies from San Jose Christian College, and master's degree in Christian Apologetics from Biola University, and a master's degree in Theology from Franciscan University. So he studied a bit, folks. He's written two books, including the one that we're going to be talking about today, Twisted Unto Destruction, how the Bible Alone Has Made the World a Worse Place. And I want to say at the outset, before we welcome Donald to the show, that this is not an attack on Protestantism. It's a charitable uh, evangelization effort to let them know that not only is the Bible alone unbiblical, unhistorical, and unchristian, it wasn't invented for almost 15 centuries, that we want you to know the truth that will set you free, and it does not come from the Bible alone. In fact, it will have the opposite effect. So please don't take this as an attack. Um, and I know that our guest will say the exact same thing. So enough blabbing on my part. I want to welcome you to the show, Don. Thanks for joining us. Hey, great to be here, Brian. Thanks for having me on. Yes, absolutely. I loved your book. It was whoo, it was powerful in so many different levels. I mean, every chapter was like, wow, wow, full of facts, full of statistics, full of Bible quotes. It was just backed up. It wasn't just assertions. It was backed up by facts. So maybe you can give us and start by giving us an uh, an overview of the problems of Sola Scriptura and Protestantism and kind of how it has made the world a worse place. And then we can go into deeper uh, detail. Sure. So in a very like broad sense, I think what Protestantism does, particularly the assertion that we should live by the Bible alone as our only standard for faith and morals, and this is what I grew up doing, is that, in fact, it's very similar to atheism in that it cuts us free from any actual standard of objective right and wrong. And so I actually spent years, I mean, I still do, but spent years debating atheists on this very topic, that if you believe, for example, that matter is all there is, that we live in a closed system of cause and effect, that you actually can't say to me that such and such, whatever it might be, torturing babies for fun is one that we often use, right? <laughs> that you actually can't say that that's objectively wrong. It might be an opinion, but you can't say that it's wrong. Uh, in a similar way, Protestantism, by cutting us loose from the authority of the Catholic Church and tradition and any sort of institutional accountability structure, what it has done is not only set us free from an objective standard of right and wrong, but, and this is where I spend most of the book, it has actually made things worse by giving many vices, many sins, a divine mandate. So that not only are we doing wrong, but we are doing wrong in the name of God, that we are doing wrong with a backing in Scripture. Like we're saying, hey, the Bible wants me to do this. Like Jesus wants me to do this. And it's a vice. It's an evil. It's Sometimes we're actually advocating deadly sins in the name of Jesus, backed up with scripture. And so that's like the overarching project. I say at the beginning, like this is my thesis, that the Bible alone not only does not provide the objective basis for right and wrong, but actually makes things worse because it provides those evils a divine mandate. And so then I, I go on and give some examples of that from, well, from my own life, but also from history. Yeah, and this is the book, People Twisted Unto Destruction. And some of the things that really kind of made my eyes widen was your whole third chapter, I believe is third chapter on uh, slavery and just how the entire 
almost the entire slavery movement was based on the Bible alone. It was based on Protestants who were justifying slavery in the eyes of God using the Bible. And you give an innumerable amount of sources from the highest levels. Even Bob Jones from Bob Jones University was excoriating people as the Antichrist themselves, if they rejected slavery, which is from God, like I was like, whoa, you know, like some <laughs> of the, so I think these, these things would shock many Protestants today because I don't think they know them. But before we get to that topic, before we get there, um, maybe we can discuss um, how the Bible alone has brought out moral relativism in the world today, because all Christians are against moral relativism. But I don't think Protestants realize that they are really the ones who are accountable for bringing about that moral relativism. And um, even perhaps uh, you had mentioned uh, a, uh, I can't remember how you termed it, but basically just a decline in morals because of that. Can you just talk about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I think if everyone uh, lives in the same country that uh, you and I do, that they're probably a little bit concerned about the state of society, right? Like whether you're scrolling social media or just looking around you or if you got your kids in school. I mean, I got four kids and man, it is a hard time to be a, a teenager, especially in this culture, um, yeah. that you got to be concerned about this, right? You got to be uh, out there. I, I argue you got to be out there fighting against this. So like, for example, my latest film is on the transgender movement. Well, I parents have to be aware of what's going on and they have to be fighting against this. And so I get, I get broad agreement on that, Brian, actually. So like just recently we were out uh, here at the anti convention center um, with a peaceful protest in front of a bunch of doctors at their national convention, trying to tell them, please do not medicalize children with off label uh, sterilizing drugs. Don't be doing double mastectomies on 13 year olds like this sort of thing. Right. And so you get broad agreement on that from a wide variety of people like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's right. We shouldn't be doing uh, breast removals on 15 year old girls. OK, however, <laughs> in as much as many people agree on that, I actually believe that there's only one ultimate standard that provides enough foundation to say why that's wrong, ultimately, and why we shouldn't do that. And this is what moral relativism, I think we get this in the culture, like, well, on what basis do we argue against, you know, did we argue against same-sex marriage? On what basis do we argue against abortion? On what basis do we argue against any of the evils in our society, you have to have a standard by which to say, here is what's right, and what's contrary to this is wrong. And the thing is, there's if you have a shifting standard, or if it's your personal opinion, or if it's some sort of arbitrary thing that some guy laid down uh, a long time ago that we can just dismiss at our whim, that's not a good enough standard, right? It has to be objective, unchangeable, based in nature, I would argue. Um, and so that moral relativism is not, I mean, Christians kind of get it, I guess, but they don't see how far it spreads. And what I try to do is push that discussion into the realm of the Bible, actually, that if you only have the Bible, that that actually isn't strong enough, that does not provide an objective basis for right and wrong. And here's why. Without an authoritarian... Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. So basically, you're rejecting... <laughs> So basically, you're rejecting the Bible. You don't like the Bible, and yeah, you don't well, think okay, the Bible right. has any authority, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Of course. Yeah, good. I'm glad you point that out. No, so <laughs> I'm. I uh, obviously the Bible has authority. It's the Word of God. Um, I grew up in a Bible believing, Bible advocating, Bible preaching family church. I still do my like my family. I, I attend evangelical churches a lot. Um, so it's not that the Bible isn't an authority, but you have to understand how books work, right? Like how literature works, how words on a page work. Words on a page have to be interpreted. So, I mean, you, you've you held up my book there, Brian, a couple of times. Well, there's an interpretation, there's a meaning that I was trying to convey by writing those words down on that book or in that book. You might misinterpret my meaning. When you pick up the words in that book, they don't speak for themselves. You have to interpret them. So you read English, it's written in English. <laughs> you just say, I think this word means this. I think this word means this. You interpret it. But it's possible that your interpretation of those words are not what I intended. And it might be my fault. Maybe I was unclear. Okay. But that's just the nature of words. Like in a book, the book does not speak for itself and correct you if you misinterpret. If I'm not alive 
to and and on your podcast to help you understand what I was trying to say. Again, it might have been my fault. Um, you're left with, well, I this is how I read it. And maybe somebody comes along, let's say, you know, <laughs> this is not going to happen, but let's say the book became very popular and started movements. And then I died. And you've got like Brian, you've got like the Brian interpretation of this. This is how I think what Don was saying. But you've got another group over there that interprets it completely different. Well, if I'm gone, who's to say? There's nobody to say. So you could, you know, that's how you get factions. And this, this is what I mean by moral relativism within uh, the Protestant dynamic, if you will. Sola Scriptura does not speak for itself. The Bible does not speak for itself. It requires interpreters. Those interpreters do not always come to the same interpretation. And there is no way to, um, there's no way to judge between multiple interpretations because there's no authority above that. And as such, you are left with simply arbitrary opinions. And then when it comes to morals, which, of course, the Bible's full of admonitions and our ethics, supposedly, like when I grew up, the, the, the saying was, the Bible alone is sufficient for faith and morals. That was our mantra. Well, when it comes to morals, if that is a shifting standard that's up basically up to the whim of me or the local preacher or the head of my Bible study or whatever, that's not good enough. I, I can make the Bible say whatever I want. And so you actually end up with a similar moral relativism to what in Christian circles in America we have decried for a long time uh, with atheists and secularists. We say, hey, we can't have this moral relativism. Well, the fact is, we do. The Bible alone actually doesn't help that. Um, it, it And often, again, as I said, it it's going to make things worse. Yeah, and I hear Protestants all the time say to me, like, oh, you know, you know what? Stop creating arguments. You know, Jesus is enough. We all believe in Jesus, and that's all you need. That is so, that is, that's moral relativism in a nutshell. Jesus is all you need. We all have Jesus. It doesn't matter what we believe as long as we believe in Jesus. Well, I say, you know, Mormons believe in Jesus. Muslims believe in Jesus, Jehovah's Witness. I mean, that's just a dangerous statement. Well, you know, well, but they're false religions. But that's not your criteria. Your criteria was that they believe in Jesus. And as long as we believe in Jesus, we're fine. Well, okay. Well, you have to believe in him as the Son of God and believe in him as your Savior. Great. Mormons believe in him as the Son of God and as the Savior. So do Jehovah's Witnesses. So does the Church of God, you know? So, you know, again, this is just morally relativistic, and it's to overlook the fact that some Protestants believe in salvation um, by faith, and you don't have to do anything, not even a single good work. You don't even have to live out your faith. Some Protestants say you can go murder, kill, and steal, and you'll still go to heaven. Others say that's ridiculous. And so, you, others say that, you know, infant baptism is necessary. This is a Protestant saying this. Others say that's ridiculous. So, from both sides, you have people, you can't just say, oh, well, as long as we believe in Jesus, because we believe completely different things, right down to the very doctrines of how we're saved. And this is some of the moral, moral relativism that I hear among Protestants that's concerning. Yeah, um, I would add to that, take that to the next level. Like uh, you say, well, you know, we just need to believe in Jesus or um, or we just need the Holy Spirit. Like I have the Holy Spirit to guide me. Like, yes, I have the Bible, but I also have the Holy Spirit. Well, this again, this actually makes things worse because <laughs> we all know if you've ever sat in a small group Bible study, I am, I, and I know that all the Protestants uh, watching this and listening to this, you know what I'm talking about. You get into a small group Bible study and you've got a go around the circle and everybody has a multiple opinions are one of the, and, and you say, well, the Holy Spirit should guide us. Which one of those people does not have the Holy Spirit, right? That's, that's not an option. What actually happens is everybody thinks that they have the Holy Spirit. Everybody thinks that they have the, uh, the Spirit guiding them. And what actually happens then is that it gives their opinion an added weight. And so it gives like your opinion, like now I'm speaking on behalf of God, like if the Holy Spirit's guiding me and this is my interpretation and you're against me, well, you're against the Holy Spirit. You're now anti-God. And it actually makes those, it makes those arguments much worse and much stronger because each side thinks that they're like now a prophet speaking on behalf of God. And who's going to back down from that? Right. And this, so this is actually, I mean, this is what the Bible alone made slavery and the whole racism thing much worse in America than it had to be. Because as soon as slaves got started being sold in America, we provided a biblical justification for that. Well, if you have a biblical justification for doing what you uh, are doing and selling slaves, and I go through many very particular instances of this in the book where 
Um, it was recommended, you know, it was good for these Africans to be uh, sold into slavery and brought over here because then they're going to know about Jesus. And it's good for them to be put into, into uh, slavery because they are the descendants of Ham. And we all know that Ham is the cursed race and that the, as the blessed race of Shem, that we need to, to help them. And all these biblical arguments actually entrenched racism and slavery into America as a godly thing. And so by the time yeah. you get... By the time you get to the Civil War, you've got the South, well, in the North, but especially the South, they're literally fighting a divine, what they see as a divine crusade to, to defend the Bible and God himself by defending slavery. And it just wouldn't, it wouldn't have been that way if they didn't have the sola scriptura ability to twist scripture to make it say whatever they want. And you give a lot of examples in your book of this, of Protestants warring with each other, you know, theologically, um, doctrinally over a lot of these different things. Um, but one thing you said I, I thought was very interesting was that you said that the Bible alone leads not only to hyper-individualism, but also to hi uh, moral hyper-individualism. Can you explain that? Can you explain uh, hyper-individualism and the, really the problem with that? And I mean, you've touched on it, but maybe a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I, we kind of decry, at least hopefully we decry the the atomization of our culture, right? Like the bowling alone kind of situation where everybody's separate from everybody else. Well, let's look back at where, where that came from. Uh, the Bible alone separated us from any sort of ecclesial authority, any sort of authority above us, any sort of unity that we have um, with any sort of church family. And I know we've tried, we've tried it within Protestantism to try to figure out church, but anybody who's looked at this seriously knows that ecclesiology like the doctrine of the church has been the absolute weak part like calvin's this brilliant guy uh, with the institutes of course i don't believe what calvin wrote but his doctrine of the church is just absolutely minuscule because there's no reason for us to come together right it, bible alone separates it, it makes you your own little divine authority it's just you and the bible it's just you and jesus um and so it does have this atomizing effect but then that also applies to morals so that everybody can basically do, in the words of scripture, what is right in their own eyes. Because what else, what, what else do you have? All you have is your own eyes in the Bible. And you can make the Bible say whatever you want. You can, I look back at, at, at my time growing up, and I mean, I again, I I grew up in a Bible-saturated context. I memorized thousands of Bible verses. I was at Bible study on Wednesday nights. I was at Bible youth group. I spent all summers at Bible camp. I went to Bible college. <laughs> like It was all Bible. And I'm thankful. I'm very thankful for all the Bible that I learned. But when I look back and say, well, like when I looked at this passage, what did I do with it? Like, how did I read that passage? Well, it's amazing how you can just like completely glaze over certain passages of scripture because they don't adhere to what you want them to really you know you read the like i remember reading the sermon on the mount and the beatitudes like seriously for the first time in my younger 20s and i was like where has this been all my life like this is radical teaching you know like this is insane <laughs> what is jesus talking about here where did i you know or john 6 the the this is my body what was I what was I reading before? I well, you just interpret it a different way. You skim over it. You can make the Bible say whatever you want. And what the effect is, though, that you can live however you want. So I was living just your average, you know, chasing after all of the things that the world tells us to chase after as a 19, 20 year old. The Bible had zero effect on that. If anything, I was resting comfortably in my salvation because I'd said the prayer or whatever, you know, as a youngster. I might and add I, that. I might add that you're adding to that uh, Protestant pastors galore, as you show in your final chapters, have actually justified running with the world, following the yeah. world, doing what the world does using the Bible. Yeah, that's right. You can you can make the Bible again. You can make the Bible say whatever you want. Uh, I was scrolling through Instagram just last week, and this Christian um, influencer mother with over 150,000 150, followers, by the way, uh, gave this exposition of Genesis chapter 1 to defend the transing of her daughter. So her daughter has now um, is now identifying as a boy. 
And she said, well, here's the reason why that God wanted me to do this. And she goes into this about how Genesis 1 tells us that, you know, God creates in their image. Like God's not he or she, therefore we're in, we're in their image. So we should be able to use, like, it's all this nonsense, but it's scripturally backed. And now I'm looking at that saying, now we've got, we've got a lot of Christian mothers and fathers who are reading this, who maybe had been on the sidelines, right? Who maybe had been... Um, unsure about the whole trans thing. Now they're like, oh, I, I guess trans is a Christian thing. I guess this is from the Bible. We can do this. That's the danger, right? It's that you can defend evil from the Bible. And this um, is where we really need to open our eyes to to the danger. It's a, it's a, a personal individual, a hyper individualism that basically makes you, gives you the ability to justify whatever you want to justify in your life. You want to go live with your boyfriend or girlfriend? Hey, God wants me to be happy. I can find it in scripture. Gay marriage? Oh, sure. Let's find it in scripture. You know, all of these things, we can find them. And then if you want to live that way, uh, you can do so now with this like pat on the back, like, hey, I'm I'm being a good Christian. And that's, I mean, this is very insidious. Yeah. And uh, this happened from the beginning, didn't it? I mean, ever since the beginning of the Reformation, when Luther kind of popularized the Bible alone, right off the bat, morality plummeted, which he lamented later, and you talk about that in your book. Um, arguments, fights between not only the Reformers, but between Luther and his friends, fellow theologians. I mean, everyone just kind of started warring with each other right from the get-go about how you properly interpret Scripture, and they fiercely condemned one another based on what? Scripture. And so, yeah. you know, people say, well, you can correct each other using Scripture, but okay, but it all comes back to whose interpretation of Scripture and who has more authority than the per next person. If Scripture is the highest authority, but you're the one interpreting it, and so are a thousand other people. Well, then there's a thousand opinions interpreting an authority, but none of you have authority over the other person. So it's just kind of a constant secular argument, isn't it? I mean, maybe you could talk about a little bit about uh, Luther and how he kind of <laughs> kind of started. Yeah, well, I mean, the solo scripture and the falling out of it. Yeah, so I think Luther is an interesting character in that. I, I don't think he intended at the beginning. He it's not he wasn't intending soul the scripture, right? He had a fight with the Catholic Church over the doctrine of salvation. And so he is defending a particular view of how one gets saved, how one gets to heaven. Um a, a, a legal justification that the church said, no, that's heresy. Sorry, we're not going to change this. So Luther wanted the church to agree with him. They said no. Then he got backed into a corner, right? It's not like he was flipping through the Bible one day and came across the doctrine of sola scriptura. That was, it was never his intention. He never found it anywhere. He got backed into a corner over a theological debate. And then he had a couple of options, I think, personally. I mean, I don't know what other options he would have had, but either he, he quits, he says, okay, I, the church disagrees with me, or he stands up and says, hey, you should listen to me because I'm a prophet of God and I'm going to start my own religion. As an Augustinian monk, I mean, that's, you know, he's going to get laughed out of it. He's, nobody's going to do that. But what he does do is he says, actually, what I'm doing is I am using the Bible and the Bible alone is my authority. Like it was an it was a fallback. Uh, I think he got, you know, backed into a corner and said, how can I justify my opinion? Oh, I will say it's the Bible. And it sounded great. Like, hey, okay, yeah, let's 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 go with the Bible alone. And so people started, but immediately, this is the crazy thing. Immediately, even Luther's closest friends, like Zwingli, who agreed with him on everything except things like the Eucharist, immediately they started fighting. And so you have the, uh, you know, in, in fact, the fighting got so bad they tried to call a, a colloquy together to get these people to agree. They could not. They would not agree. And not only would they not agree, but because they both now didn't have any sort of ecclesial authority and all thought they were on God's side, uh, you read Luther's writing and he's all, he's constantly calling people Satan, you know, like this guy is a tool of Satan. <laughs> well, that makes sense, doesn't it? If the whole, If you've got the Holy Spirit and you're interpreting scripture according to the Holy Spirit, and that guy disagrees with you, even though he agrees with church tradition forever, he's now on the side of Satan. So you get these very um, adamant, and frankly, then very violent, why did these wars of religion break out? Because everybody thought they were on the side of God. 
Like they were so serious about it. These wars were salvation uh, that everybody thought they were on the side of God. Now, ironically, again, almost immediately um, with people disagreeing with Luther, I guess he thought everybody would just read the Bible and see what he saw. I, don't, I actually don't <laughs> think he would. I actually don't think he was a very good philosopher. Like, I don't think he logically saw what was going to happen, actually. Uh, because he seems very surprised that everybody's suddenly disagreeing with him. Very surprised, yeah. yeah. And if so, I could just add one thing, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Like when he said that, uh, it's, it's not like he said, oh, I'm going to go buy the Bible alone. He said, if you can't convince me by this book, meaning if you can't tell me based on what I see in my interpretation, if you can't undo what I believe, then I'm not going to believe it. Because it wasn't like the Catholic Church didn't believe in the Bible. It wasn't oh, like they weren't yeah, going by right. the Bible. Yeah, they were absolutely going by the Bible. And I want to make that clear to our Protestant uh, followers is that they were they were having disagreements on the Bible. They were having discussions on the Bible. But what did Luther say? Well, I'm not convinced. Well, uh, Calvin wasn't convinced with your interpretation and neither was Zwingli and neither <laughs> right. was the Anabaptists and any of the yeah. others. Yeah, no, that's right. The church uses scripture, but then the church provides an authoritative interpretation, right? Like it, the church, and not on every verse, it's not like we have an, a, an authoritative ecclesial interpretation of every passage or every every doctrine as far as that goes, but on the ones that they proclaim, they give it to us. So you have that. So they're operating on two different levels, right? So, so um, Luther might say, hey, you need to show me from scripture. But the church, on one hand, it can, I, I will show you from scripture, but realize that I also provide the authoritative interpretation of that. Uh, it's not like, otherwise, there's no way. I mean, it's a useless conversation. Uh, you cannot, if it's only interpretation, I mean, there's rules, obviously, but then you have to decide, okay, well, what's a good rule for interpretation? I, I get that. I, I write about that extensively in my previous book, but you can't, at the end of the day, it's my interpretation versus yours. And if there's no authoritative interpreter, you're left with uh, an impasse. You're also left with a bunch of people doing stuff that Luther didn't like. Like he was appalled at the ethics of his fellow Protestants during his age. He's, he, I think his quote was, they are eight times more likely to be doing bad stuff than the Catholics. He's like, you guys are now worse than the Catholics. And so he was he was appalled at, at what uh, resulted. Uh, but again, I just don't think he he was a great... Uh, he was. A, he was also uh, appalled that they were justifying it with scripture, like he would. They yeah. were embarrassing him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You, yeah, but that's what happens. I mean, and that's what's been happening ever since. Isn't that what led to the peasant massacre? The uh, Luther was. They say is responsible for really just massacring one hundred thousand peasants. Even Protestants say it's a huge black mark on the Protestant record because he was so embarrassed by how much they were misusing the Bible that he he thought they were the most unruly animals on the earth. And so he just wanted to put a stop to that and just he did it yeah. in a violent way. Yeah. Well then that's right. It it got very violent. And that violence, I mean people don't realize the effects of not only the peasants massacre but just all those wars of religion during that time the effects are immense to this day in the way that people now think about god and religion because we had to have such a sharp divide now between like the only way there was like how are we going to have a civilization that gets along with each other in this protestant uh, context and not kill each other and they basically had to isolate religion into this private sector of your life. So like in the Netherlands, for example, you're like, you know what? We're just going to make money. We're just going to buy and sell stuff and go after consumerism. And you keep your little religion stuff to yourself in a private realm um, because we have to live together. So we will live together based on consumerism. And that sort of thing is what is what was necessary. And the sharp divide, like when my, you know, my I'm talking to my high schoolers about um, faith they automatically divide their life into like, well, there's my public life and my job life and my career life and my family life. There's my faith life over here. That's all a result of what Luther did. <laughs> okay. he, that dividing, that atomization of society, that the way we have to think about faith now even, it's a, a huge disaster um, in, in many more ways than, <laughs> than even I put in my book, but that we generally realize. Yeah, one thing that struck me in your book is, you know, you, you know, uh, Luther just 
went to town on Zwingli, you know, for disagreeing with the Eucharist, called him from Satan because he disagreed with the Eucharist and Calvin as well. But then the Anabaptists called Luther from Satan because they he was for baptizing infants. And, you know, like they all condemned each other as from Satan and because they all didn't believe their personal interpretation of the Bible. And that's kind of the weapon that they use. Well, you're disagreeing with me, as you said, so you're disagreeing with God. Therefore, you're from the devil. We just did a hour and 15 minute interview with two former seventh day adventists yesterday and ellen g white their founder that her whole um beginning was that she thought her writings were inspired similar to the bible everything that she received was from the holy spirit and if you disagreed with her you were literally from satan literally and so if you look at all the foundings of the the churches and the different denominations what do they say if you don't agree with us you're from satan what happens when two protestants in a church yell at each other and they can't agree they go start two different churches and start condemning each other and i see this all the time even in my town there's split churches in my town Town where the people fought with each other so fiercely they couldn't agree that they just went and started their own churches. And it's like, that is not what God wanted. That is not what Jesus gave us. Jesus said there is only one church, one faith, one hope, one baptism, one doctrine, and the unity of belief. I mean, that's all I see throughout the unit uh about throughout the New Testament is Paul calling for the unity of belief and really harshly condemning schism. But yet that is what Protestantism has produced for. 500 plus years now. It's interesting you bring up Seventh-day Adventism, I think of Mormonism. Those all those all developed, by the way, out of the very same area in upstate New York at the very same time, the burned over district of upstate New York. Uh, but that they're actually, I know that, you know, my evangelical friends sort of separate them as like, well, that's a separate cult. And this whole idea of getting a divine revelation and writing it down on golden tablets or whatever, Joseph Smith, like, oh, no, we don't do that. You know, we use the Bible. But actually, it's not quite as different as you think it is, because in practice, what happens with uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, with the Mormons, is that you have a text that you believe is divinely inspired, and your interpretation of it is what you need to go with. You're basically doing the same thing as a Protestant. When you take the book and interpret it your way, and then say to everyone else, well, this is what God says here. Like the Bible, when I say the Bible says, you know, it's always Billy Graham's big thing. Like the Bible says, what you are saying is, well, I say, and well, God is speaking through me. I mean, you're taking on a prophetic uh, mandate there, actually. And this is why it's not, it's not that similar to starting your own religion, actually, because <laughs> you basically are. You Every little church plant that is the result of a previous split because of one guy's interpretation of the text is a starting his own little mini religion and that's the same thing so they they actually go there's a reason that thing like mormonism and seventh day and all the other adventist movements and all the cults that, that have appeared in america they all have the same philosophy and it is that protestant philosophy there's obviously there's some differences but that people need to realize how closely tied um, like that, that Holy Spirit revival era of upstate New York in the 1800s. I mean, Mormonism came out of there for a reason. Okay. That's, uh, it all is kind of part of the same thing. Yeah. I got into a, a hour and a half full length debate on our uh, YouTube channel here with a, with a Protestant about whether we can be saved, whether you can know for sure that you're saved. And he thought it was a Catholic versus Protestant issue. But I said, I would I would assert that most Protestants don't even believe this. I mean, so this is really a Protestant versus Protestant issue. And you're both using the Bible and you're both using the same verses, but you're both interpreting them differently. And uh, I got into a discussion on the phone recently uh, with, a, with a great young man. And he was telling me that... Um, well, you know, Luther got some things right, but he got other things wrong. And I've realized that because I said, how did you realize that? He's like, oh, by, by reading the Bible. And I, he, I was like, well, you sound Calvinist to me. He's like, yeah, well, you know, I kind of relate to Calvin too, but you know, Calvin got some things wrong too. And I said, well, how do you know that? He's like, well, you know, because I read the Bible. He's like, you know, what I found in the Bible is that Luther got some right and some wrong. Calvin got some right and some wrong, but you know, 
what I preach is the truth. Kind of what you were saying, yeah. this is the truth. And yeah. I could not get him for the life of me to see, maybe God will open his eyes someday. The fact that every Protestant says that, and they all disagree with, there are millions of Protestants who disagree with his truth, but they're saying, oh, well, he gets, he, sure, he gets some things right, but he gets other things wrong. Well, how do I know? Well, because I go by the Bible and I'm inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's literally a secular argument to infinity, ad nauseum, and it just does not work. It's uh, it's interesting. I mean, having lived through that, it is interesting how um, we don't think about it. We don't think, uh, and I share a little bit of my story at the beginning of the book, but we just, we don't, like, I thought the same thing. I remember when I would pick preachers and I'm like, yeah, I like this about it. I like that about this guy. And I had, I picked and choose and I would preach a particular message. <laughs> I remember I was working at a church and I, uh, I preached a message one day that was very well received, frankly. Um, but and I didn't think much of it. And the, and it, I, but I got pulled up. One of the guys in the congregation pulled me like aside later and actually ended up bringing me before the board because I was preaching something against the founding documents of the church. Well, here's the, the crazy thing about that was I, he actually was right. I didn't I didn't know this. Nobody else knew it either. But I actually was preaching against the founding documents of this particular you know d- denomination, and uh, you know. But nobody thinks about those kind of things really. We just all go along like, oh, this is, sounds good. This sounds good. We'll take a little bit here, a little bit there. But it's a free for all actually. Um, but it's amazing. I. I I understand like experientially, Brian, what that guy, like why he just goes along with that. Because for some, I don't know, we just don't think about it. We just like, yep, I just pick and choose. I, and that's the truth. You know, it's like, and then you say like your truth. Oh, well, I mean, not my truth, but that is it's what the you're Holy saying. the Holy Spirit's truth. <laughs> yeah, right. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. Yeah. But, but how, and this is not an attack at all, but how arrogant that you and you alone have discovered the truth that no one else could find in 2000 years and that every other denomination and Protestant individual person has got wrong, but you and you alone have that truth. And so does everybody else, by the way, but nobody else thinks everyone else has the truth and only them. It's like, like the blinders just need to come off no. to see how audacious it is. That And that is, uh, it is blinders. I've, I've had that exact discussion. Like I talked to a good friend of mine <laughs> who, who literally um, said, you know, what do you think about this position? A, a particular position that he had found from scripture. And I'm like, well, if that was true, I actually said to him, I'm like, you'd be the first one in the history of Christianity to believe it. <laughs> but I was like, it didn't actually phase him that much. He's like, I don't know. Maybe. I'm like, no, what, what are you what yeah. are you talking about? A hundred percent. They don't think about it. They're like, well, that's what the Bible says. They don't yeah, think if you, yeah. God would not wait 2022 years to reveal the one <laughs> truth that everybody's missed. It's the same thing that Mormons claim that in 1829, God finally revealed the truth to Joseph well, Smith. This is, this is what I'm saying about the, the connection. There is a connection between these cultish movements and it's the same thing. So you're you're exactly right. Yeah, and God would not wait 1,500 years to reveal sola scriptura, and he would not wait uh, 2,000 years to reveal all these other new things that we finally figured out that everybody else got wrong. So it just doesn't work. I mean, Jesus, as Scott Hahn, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, he was on our channel once, and he said, you know what? When I became Catholic, I'd studied the early church. I studied the founding fathers. I started everything, and I finally figured out that I did not need to reinvent the wheel. Jesus gave us the truth. He gave it to his apostles. They made sure that people taught them it purely. And if anyone was off base on it, they corrected them fiercely. And that truth was passed on down through the ages. We don't need to refigure it out. It has already been given to us down through the church. And he said, that is such a relief as a pastor. I had to find this. Steve Wood too. Steve Wood said, how can I stand before my parish as a pastor and say, this is the truth of the Bible when every other pastor on my street disagrees with me? He's like, how do I know I have the truth? And he's like, once I joined the Catholic truth and realized the truth has been there for 2000 years, he's like, such a breath of fresh air that I don't have to figure it all out all over again. You know, I've, I've worked on a lot of Protestant church staffs, and this is exactly what happens. They are constantly trying to figure out 
what to do. Like they're constantly trying to reinvent the wheel. You, If you work on a, on a church staff for any amount of time, give yourself two years, you will probably in those two years, once a year, <laughs> go through a renewal of your mission statement. You're trying to figure out, they're constantly trying to figure out mission statements and strategies for reaching the next generation. Like they're constantly trying to figure out how to do church. And it is stressful. Okay. It's because they're costly. Like, I don't know what, what should, they're digging through the Bible. What do we do next? It is such a relief when you get out of that mess, but they don't realize that they're, I'm like, why you, you're constantly pressure to try to figure out what church is actually, right? That's what they're trying to do because they don't have a solid understanding of what church is. And so you're, you couldn't be more right about that. My, my anecdotal evidence supports that as well. The last thing I'll say about this is that, um, for this section we can finish up this section on uh before we move on to slavery and other things but um the people don't realize that protestants have tradition they condemn catholics for having tradition but they have tradition too it's just a different tradition they say we go by the bible but the bible alone is not in the bible nowhere is it taught in the bible in fact i've just unleashed four uh part series so far on our catholic TikTok, catholic truth TikTok, and i said can you please find for me the bible alone in the bible and i get one of three responses one oh you're just you don't like the bible you don't think it's authoritative that's typical of a catholic okay i didn't say that we love the bible it is authoritative but it's not the final authority on all matters nor does it claim to be so again can you find that for me in the bible the second one is uh 2 timothy 3 16 which says that it's helpful in completing a christian and for reproof and doctrine so i say yes it is helpful you know if i play baseball it's helpful for me to learn how to bat but it's also helpful for me to learn how to catch and to pitch and to run and all these other things it's it's helpful it's not complete nor does it say it is and the third thing is just to dismiss it as oh well you follow tradition but you know you you believe in adding things to the bible we don't I, except that you're adding this to the bible because no one believed it for 1500 years your personal interpretation your personal tradition is being added to the bible and you're making an entire religion and doctrine around it so yeah i believe that they do have uh their own traditions as well there's many more i can name oh yeah they're, no they're always Alter calls the yeah. Well, a tradition and often some type and some type of liturgy as well, right? Like they, they actually go through uh, a, a sort of weak, shallow liturgy, but always some kind of, of, of format. And they are always appealing to, you know, their favorite when they say some Protestants explicitly say it, it's not sola or it is sola scripture, but it's not solo scripture. So I rely on, you know, Calvin or whatever. Well, that's just pushing it back one level. I mean, that's not, that's still the Bible alone. And, you know, who's to say that Calvin has the authoritative interpretation. So no, you're, you're right. They, they have a, a, a small T tradition that isn't any more authoritative, frankly, than the Bible alone. Yeah. And the last thing I'll just say is that the Bible does condemn man-made traditions. That's true. But it also promotes godly traditions like in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 and 2 Thessalonians 2.15, among other passages. So with that being said, I want to just re uh, throw in your book here, Twisted Unto Destruction. You can buy it on, uh, I believe, Catholic Answers Press, catholic.com, right? Yeah, Amazon has it as well. Um, you can uh, get a link to it at donjohnsonmedia.com. We'll get you a link to uh, both sites. Um, yeah, for sale today. I highly recommend it. And um, I believe it is uh, the following chapter after you go into the Bible alone, you talk about uh, slavery and that, wow, what a powerful chapter that was. Um, you talked about how practically all slavery in America came from Protestantism and as justified from the Bible. I didn't realize how steeped in the Bible it was till you quoted leader after leader after leader high up of the top protestant leaders in the country maybe in the world who are justifying slavery with the bible and condemning people as unspiritual and basically sons of satan who did not agree with slavery because they were not biblical christians not true biblical christians so maybe it can give an overview of this chapter and talk a bit about slavery and protestantism in the bible alone Sure. I mean, just to set the stage, if you will, uh, America, I would say, is the um, purest Protestant project that we have in history, in that there just wasn't many Catholics that showed up to begin with. It was largely Protestants. And they were then, of course, all Bible believers. Like the, It was a Christian culture in the sense that um, 
we needed to appeal to scripture to really support our positions. So when those first slaves were sold back in 1619, the people like had some problems with it, right? Like, hey, should we really be selling human beings? I mean, doesn't that go against uh, what Jesus told us to love our neighbors and he's made in the image of God? Like there was legitimate problems. And, and But how it always goes is you get, so I'm not, I'm not blaming I should be clear about something. I'm not blaming them for like inventing slavery or something, right? I mean, of course, no. I mean, what I'm saying is that when a sin comes and and becomes attractive in the culture, a particular vice takes hold in a culture, that the Bible alone, and in this instance, the Protestants in the colonies, were unable to adequately fight against it and in fact made it worse. So let me contrast, for example, what the Catholic position was. Even before the age of exploration, like right at the beginning of it, the the papal bulls were fairly constant in saying that you cannot buy and sell human beings. I mean, the Catholic Church condemned slavery throughout. Were there Catholic slave traders? Yes, of course there were. But the official, there's a difference between Catholics being bad Catholics and the official teachings of the church. And the official teachings of the church were so clear that in many of the Spanish colonies in the New World, they banned the reading of papal documents so that they could continue to trade their slaves with a clear conscience, okay? So just to give you a background, right? That was the context. Well, in the American colonies, there's no Catholics. They don't care about, I mean, for the most part, they don't care about what the Pope says. So that's not an effect. But they do like have to appeal to scripture to support anything that they do. And so when they start selling slaves, they're like, well, what what are we supposed to do with this? It doesn't seem right. You know, their conscience is pricked. Well, almost immediately, the response was to find an argument to support it. And so the first one of the main first one was, well, these are not actual human beings. These are animals from Africa. They don't they don't rise to the level of made in the image of God. So we don't have to love them as our neighbor. You think of the uh, the person who came to Jesus and asked whether or not they had to love their neighbor, you know, <laughs> like, well, who is my neighbor? They asked next, trying to find a way out, trying to twist scripture to get out of it. So they did that in America. And that worked for some people. They're like, oh, yeah, they're just subhuman animals from Africa so that we can just continue to live our Christian life and treat them like we do our cattle. Others, though, um, guys like Cotton Mather, who's a very famous American preacher, one of the premier American preachers, he said, no, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't match with how I interpret scripture. And so he actually thought that um, they had a soul and that we should be trying to save these Africans. But his approach was, well, we can save their soul, but that doesn't mean that their body has to be free. And so he would see, he would look at the Bible and he preached extensively on this using scripture to say, yes, we save the souls. And they would use even passages from like the Old Testament where the blood of the soul is in the garment. I mean, this is weird stuff. But we would, they had this dualism that developed, which is a Protestant thing, too, by the way, a kind of a Gnostic dualism that separates soul from body. And we would so they would preach to save the slave souls, but they would preach also to keep their bodies in bondage (laughs) and they would use scripture to support it. And then they would, you know, like um, the book of Philemon where Onesimus is, is Paul tells him to, Hey, can you take your slave back? They would use verses like this to defend slavery. Um, And right, like Paul didn't condemn slavery. He actually (laughs) told him to return his slave. meaning It's okay. It's okay. Right. Which is of course not how the church has, has interpreted that passage to justify slavery, but they did. And so you had a movement now where in fact uh, they got, they even got the government of Britain to pass a law that said slaves who became Christians um, would remain slaves. Cause that was not the tradition to, you could not enslave fellow Christians. That was the, the tradition within Europe is that you didn't do that to fellow Christians. Um, so that was going to be a concern. They changed the law. They said, well, we did, we saved their souls. And in fact, they made part of the baptismal vows for, for saved Africans um, that they would vow not to want to get freedom from their slavery. And they started preaching from Romans about respecting authority and how this was good. You know, it's it's actually better for these heathen Africans to come and be saved in this way. Well, so this went from being sort of like 
I don't know, feel uncomfortable with slavery to actually, hey, slavery is a great blessing that God has given us. And that slavery is when we are are enslaving uh, Africans and bringing them over here on ships, and many of them die. I mean, that happens. But this is actually God's way of of saving these Africans and advancing his gospel in the world. And we as a shining city on a hill here in America are doing his <laughs> are doing his will by by enslaving Africans, right? Well, this this is very insidious and has an effect that we this has an effect that we see today. You can still find these arguments like the curse of Ham. They started intricate uh, theological discussions about the curse of Ham and what that meant. And, and well, that's the African race. And so he cursed them by giving them black skin and they're supposed to be perpetually enslaved and all this stuff. You, I mean, you, you can hear those arguments in 1970 at Bob Jones University defending segregation. Bob Jones University did not allow interracial dating until 2000, by the way. Wow. That's that. But that all goes back to the colonists saying that this is God's will, that slavery is a divine institution that we are defending from Scripture. Even Protestant historians, guys like Mark Knoll, who's an esteemed uh, historian in America, Protestant guy, though, he will tell you that if we hadn't given it a divine mandate back in the colonies, that you wouldn't have had such a violent reaction to trying to get rid of slavery in America. And again, of course, on the flip side, we know that William Wilberforce, I mean, I'm not saying that we didn't have abolitionists who were also driven by scripture. But what I am saying is that the divine mandate for slavery caused it to be more entrenched in America than it would have been otherwise. And that that divine entrenchment, so when you get to the Civil War, for example, you had Southern preachers saying that we are fighting a divine battle against the atheist satanic Northerners on behalf of the Bible itself in when we are defending slavery. That's how they preached about the Civil War. That's why you have, for example, Southern Baptists. Biggest denomination in the country is a Southern Baptist. Well, why are they Southern? What's the, what is that about? Because the Baptists split and the Southern became Southern Baptists to defend slavery. That's the only reason we have a Southern Baptist as opposed to Northern Baptist or any other one. They literally split from the Northern Baptist to defend slavery. That's the only reason we have a Southern Baptist church. Why did they do that? Because they were convinced it was God's will. So we have this insidious evil that is being uh, perpetrated on the country in the name of God that would not have been possible if Sola Scriptura didn't exist. And you can contrast, I go into this a little bit in my chapter, but you can contrast that with the Catholic approach. Again, there was Catholic slave traders, there's Catholic racists, I get it, I get it. But the Catholic Church and its approach to the Civil War was very unique. It didn't take sides. And if you look at the few Catholics that were here, they're, um, they fought on both sides of the war, by the way. But the, the Catholics were known for their unity and their love and their taking care of each side and their, um, their unwillingness to use Scripture, for example, to defend either side. Um, so on one hand, you had like the southern uh the southern churches railing against the north because it's you were evil consumerists who were all concerned with the almighty dollar and that's why you're against our slavery okay and so that we're defending and on the other hand the northerns are like hey you are not loving people okay these are people made in the image of god we're using scripture that way but the catholics didn't really they saw both sides they saw that yes they condemned the north for avarice and they condemned the south for slavery and that was the official catholic position is that both sides are wrong. <laughs> well, you just don't, Sola Scripture does not provide that authority to do that. Uh, and, the, you know, as you go through, there's many other stories as you go through the history of racism in America, but the Catholic Church has been very unique in its in its role, and by the Bible has been uh, a constant source of, um, I would I would call evil, Frank. I mean, they're, to use it in the source of evil, uh, justifications justification i mean is it blasphemy i guess is that the right term it's you know 
it's uh it's it's blasphemy against the holy spirit at some level i think yeah no absolutely i thought that was super interesting everything that you had said um and we'll see more about racism in the third section of this video when we talk about um sexual immorality and yeah uh, eugenics and darwin darwinism and all of that and how that alone that also is justified by the bible alone and so i like what you say that there's no authority there's two sides both claiming the bible as their authority well who has authority then they're both using the bible which is the highest yeah. authority but their opinions neither one can sway each other so much so that it leads to war in a sense and so i actually didn't know about the northern baptist and, and southern baptist splitting and southern baptist being the largest denomination now and the whole thing i thought i thought that was all very interesting and if anyone wants to read like the full account of it you can check it out in uh his book twisted unto destruction how the bible alone theology has made the world a worse place this is just one chapter i mean there's other chapters on consumerism and avarice and how uh, Protestants have uh, justified that and all the health and wealth preaching all based on the Bible. And some of those are the biggest people in the country and the most popular in the country, and they're still all using the Bible. So I thought that was a very interesting chapter. But one of the saddest chapters was um, your one on sexual immorality and uh, Darwinism and contraception and how basically the... Um, Basically, your whole chapter, uh, it started by saying that every Christian was united since the beginning of Christianity, that contraception was evil, like from the devil evil, every single person, Orthodox, Protestants and Catholics, until the 1900s, when a few Protestants started trying to break away from it to keep up with worldly standards and then officially the official break first came in 1930 at the lambert conference with the anglicans who kind of made an exception for contraception in marriage but as jenna smith says you know it didn't take the world long to figure out that if you can make an exception to keep kids out of your marriage in marriage then you can keep kids out of your marriage outside of you know that as well so you know, let's just keep kids out and that has led to a whole host of problems so let's talk about let's start there maybe we can talk about um the the immorality section yeah sure so i think this is um the most uh, under reported but biggest event in in the 20th century right a century which has innumerable uh, huge events life-shattering events but the one that i think continues to do the most damage is the acceptance of contraception and um i go through it i go through it in, by the way in my movie unprotected is, is explicitly about this we talk a little bit about it in the new movie disconnected and i talk about it um in this uh, chapter but i believe it opened the door for basically all of the sexual morality that we see today and is and is leading us down a path to even worse so um from the divorce crisis to pornography the sexual objectification of women um the uh, same sex uh, explosion um, with homosexuality now transgenderism it's moving inexorably towards the acceptance of pedophilia and ultimately transhumanism um i'm no prophet or the son of a prophet i just follow the logic and i can tell you that's where it is going okay <laughs> this is where we are headed as a culture but you can we trace that are. we're there already that's right you can trace I mean, that people all are trying to justify bestiality as yep. a marriage they want to get those marriages yep. legalized and incest they're actually yep. and not just a few people like movements of them and it makes sense because they separated um our bodies and our sexual identity yeah as men and women made in the image of God and the understanding like theology of the body stuff if I'm sure we've talked about that on this show at some point right like not understanding that and separating that from our identity opened up this Pandora's box of sexual morality so what I do is I go back to that moment and I say well what how did that happen and what have been the consequences of that because that would not have happened in America if 
we had not had some sort of Christian defense on it. And as you said, this is an interesting one. Even amid all of the moral chaos and all of the moral relativism that the Protestant Reformation unleashed, contraception remained the one thing, perhaps the one, I don't know if there's another one, that everybody was united upon. I mean, Luther was certainly, he was more anti-contraception than most everybody else, actually. I mean, he was strongly, strongly against it. All of the reformers, all of the denominations, right up until the start of the 1900s, where we started to get a crack and this was driven um, most strongly in, in a popular level by Margaret Sanger, who we may know as the founder of Planned Parenthood. But she was actually not uh, initially a pro-abortion person, and in fact, never became a big fan of abortion, even throughout her rest of her life. What she was, was a contraception person. She started the Birth Control League. She fought adamantly against guys like Comstock to keep um, and to make uh, contraceptives legal and to make that as a, a like a society-wide thing. She was the main driver behind the development of synthetic hormones and the birth control pill, which finally uh, was approved by the FDA in 1960. So that's Margaret Sanger. Well, how did she accomplish all that in this nation um, and in, frankly, Western society that, you know, we all thought that was immoral? She, Before you get to how she accomplished it, do you mind yeah. if I add something? Yeah, um, I just want to say that, and we've done two long, extensive articles and videos on our channel uh, in our blogs uh, regarding her. But I, I just want to say that people, if, when you understand why she started birth control, it wasn't to keep um, what they promote at Planned Parenthood today. It wasn't just to oh, help women to get pregnant the right way. Yeah, that was part of it. But the real driving force of contraception was eugenics, was to find a master race. And in fact, at the top of her uh, birth control review magazine, sometimes it said the perfect race is to become Superman. And we do that through birth control. And she had people writing on her board and writing for her articles that also simultaneously wrote and worked for Hitler because Hitler and Sanger both learned eugenics from the same people in England and kind of, I mean, Martin Luther praised Hitler for what he was doing to exterminate the Jews and that sort of thing. Although she didn't agree with the barbaric methods, she thought that uh, birth control was a much more civilized method. But uh, you have to understand that this is where birth control came from, the grave, disgusting evil of how it developed and where it came from. And this is just scratching the surface of how evil it is. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that no, in there. No, you're exactly right. And I, I mentioned eugenics uh, in the book as well in this chapter. But no, you're, you're entirely right that it's, it's uh, racist. It's a racist, anti person person, anti-image of God, anti-family movement. It's very satanic at its core. That's she that. wanted to kill she, uh, people who were drunks or who had brain diseases or who were mentally um, special needs, they would say today. Any kind of person who wasn't absolutely of the best quality stock, she wanted to eradicate them from the earth. This is serious. Sorry, I was just like so passionate no, about this, apparently. No, it's but you're absolutely right. And it's a it's a particular understanding of what it means to be human and what what we should be. It's a very Darwinian uh approach to it. No, you're exactly right. But so for my purposes in the in this chapter, what I um focus on is how she used, she had a whole army of preachers <laughs> to provide a biblical foundation for her work. And again, like you said, she's a Darwinian eugenicist. Like she's, this is not, she could not care less about the, the Christian aspect of this. Um, in, in fact, by the way, later on, she was very clear about this. I, I show this clip in my film, Unprotected. She saw the Catholic Church as her greatest enemy, always. Mm -hmm. She was very explicit about it. Why? Well, because the Catholic Church did not change on this. Everybody else did, though. Well, how did they change? Well, she did things like have a sermon contest. They actually promoted a sermon contest in America for who could, could offer their uh, congregation the best pro-contraception sermon of the of the week or of the year or whatever. <laughs> like she had she had a whole, a whole army uh, of uh, pastors that she would take and train and she worked very hard. She was a tireless worker at making contacts with her local pastors. And so how did they do it? I mean, what? Did, well, they took the Bible and they twisted it around. They found some sort of biblical justification um, for contraception. Does the Bible really say that we should go and be fruitful and multiply and, you know, all these things like the, the usual stuff. But it's important to realize that that 
that movement was um, entirely like, so the Lambeth Conference in 1930 was the Ankling was the first like official opening, but she had laid, been laying the groundwork for a couple of decades before uh, that was her big like victory moment. Now that follow that on though, like what happens next? Well, after you open that door, you logically do have to accept things like abortion, things like homosexuality. Um, people maybe don't realize that the abortion thing uh, in, say, 1968, Christianity Today, uh, it had an entire issue dedicated to contraception and abortion. What do you think they said about it? It was pro both. OK, <laughs> it was an entire uh, issue of Christianity Today. This is Billy Graham's magazine. This is the flagship of American evangelicalism, had an extensive theological um, issue with several articles, basically trying to debunk Humanae Vitae, by the way, because this was the context for it. Pope Paul's defense of, of uh the traditional ethic of being open to life. And then along with it, an extensive theological um, defense of abortion. Evangelicals up until basically the Reagan era, the late seventies, early eighties were pro-abortion for the most part. And they used the Bible. They saw it as a Catholic issue. They used the Bible to support uh, abortion. And so even in Christianity Today, the Bible-centered magazine of, of the uh, you know basic conservative evangelicals um, used the Bible in that way. And so today, I mean... The, you it's follow- so interesting because our interview yesterday, the, the two Seventh-day Adventists said that the Adventist church is historically pro-abortion up until like the last 15 years when yeah. these two converts, they the lady was the one who made them pro-life today. But she says historically they were pro-abortion because to be pro-life was a Catholic issue and you could yeah. not be like the Catholics. You had to separate yourself from the Catholics. And so they claim to go by the commandments, but yet they just want to wipe a couple of them out. Yeah, well, no, that's exactly right. It was. It was totally seen as a Catholic thing. And that was actually a negative. That, that wasn't just Seventh-day Adventists. That was the mainstream Protestant approach to these uh, what we consider life issues, sex issues. And they were on the wrong side of it. So they accepted contraception quite quickly. They accepted abortion as a logical extension of that. And they... Um, it wasn't, it was actually a more political movement. I think when you get into it, like, well, why did they become pro-life? I mean, some people woke up a little bit, but it was actually more uh, 1980s politics, I think, that made them <laughs> more, more brought them into a pro-life position. I mean, I'll take it. I'm glad they're pro-life now, but <laughs> it, it wasn't, don't, don't kid yourself. It wasn't because the, they found it in the Bible. Yeah. So basically for 2000 years, just about, Every Christian on the face of the earth condemned contraception and abortion as evils. But then one Protestant denomination after the other just started rolling over and just trying to justify these things. And all of a sudden, they're virtually all practicing these things. And that's amazing to just 1900 years, God waited to give us the truth. And now we have the truth. Well, and and when I say that it made the world a worse place, like here's actually a good example. So in the late 60s, um, when abortion is not legal yet, okay? You had a whole like an underground railroad situation, <laughs> but for but for women who wanted abortions run by pastors, run by Protestant pastors who would find people, find women, an illegal abortion place. I'm not going to use the word clinic uh, to kill their babies, doing it in the name of Jesus based on their understanding of scripture. That's what I'm saying. Like, if you didn't have that, first of all, we would have stood stronger. (laughs) Again, we would still be to this day. And this was very appealing to me, by the way, Brian, as a convert to the Catholic faith. This is one of the things that really like put the final uh, nail in the whole thing. Is their position on contraception? That the Catholic Church is to this day, basically the only institution left in the world that's officially stands against it. Because I saw the evil. I like just as a documentary filmmaker, I saw the problems that it had caused. And it was very, very appealing to me to see that the Catholics still stand against it, even though I get it. Most Catholics do not follow their teaches church's teaching. We can have that discussion, too. But realize that the church is um, still very much on the right side of this. 
Yeah, absolutely. And uh, could you talk about um, a little bit more uh, other things that maybe you go into in this chapter? Um, were there some other things that you had mentioned? Um, well, just if you take that logically, where it's going to go, I think this is an important part of the sexual revolution. So, you know, I think a lot of us are feeling overwhelmed by the transgender movement. Well, realize that this, again, this is all very logically tied together, that we opened the door for the transgender movement when we said yes to same-sex identity, that the idea that you could be gay and that being gay was something you're born with and we love is love. And when the church, which is basically acquiesced to that now, you open the door. If your identity is up here in your sexual desires and not in who you are and your body and who God made you, if it's that, well, there is no way to, to stop transgenderism from coming, okay? But realize that you opened the door for that when you accepted contraception and the whole second wave feminist movement that was pushing it. Because that, once you open the door for contraception and the second wave feminist movement and make your identity as a woman something separate from who your body, what your body is, who you are as a reproductive being, you, that slippery slope, that's just logic, okay? <laughs> you just let that go. So realize that by giving in on contraception, we open the door to the second wave feminists who open the door for the gay rights movement that open the door for transgenderism that now along with that is pedophilia, bestiality, transhumanism. That's all coming. But because we didn't say no back at contraception, there's no stopping this now. You, yeah. it's, it, there's no, you're going, here's what happened every single time with each of those issues you have like an initial like, oh, no, we, we, we're we not sure about this to, well, does the Bible really say, I mean, does it really? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. It's kind of, maybe it's silent on the issue to, oh, actually, the Bible supports this issue. That's actually what's happening. Now we've, we're actively promoting it, right? It happens with every, it happened with contraception, happened with the women's rights, happens with the gay movement. It's happening now with transgenderism. It will happen with the next thing. Because sola scriptura, there's no other way for it to work. That's how it and works. And you forgot number three. Three, nobody can tell me I'm wrong because I'm not, yeah. because the Bible it's, says you're so. You're not wrong. And, um, yeah, I don't think people realize how intrinsically connected this is. Like, for example, when somebody says, um, well, this is how one door opens to another. When people say, oh, but why don't we make exceptions You know, for two people who truly love each other? I mean what justification does a Christian have? It used to be that God made two commands to be fruitful and multiply. In other words, love and life, babies and bonding. You love each other and you have children, you multiply. But once contraception comes around and that is taken out of the equation and it just becomes about love, it doesn't have to do anything with children anymore. Well, what's to stop two people who truly love each other from happening there? We can adopt and still have children and really help the cause of God. And then all of a sudden, what happens next? Well, if two people we've accepted now can truly love each other, and that's what's called marriage, well, what's to stop 10 people, a man and nine of his wives from getting married? Because that's what people are pushing for next. Fiercely, the polygamist movements yeah. are all pushing for that now. And they're saying, why? Why are you judging me? You know, these two people are allowed to do it in the privacy of their home. Why should it be a concern of yours what we do in the privacy of our own home? If my nine wives agree, and I love all of them, what's that to you? And another someone will come up and say, well, what's it to you if I love my animal? I've loved my animal for the last six years. And we have a relationship that you can't understand. And what I do in the privacy of my own bedroom is none of a concern to you. And so you see, I mean, what if what if me and my cousin truly love each other and we want what's the best for each other? We're going to sacrifice our loves for each other. Why can't we get married? Now, you just see this one after another, after another, after another, using the same exact rhetoric. And really, there's no, I mean, where does the Bible say slavery is wrong? Where does the Bible say cloning's wrong? Where does the Bible say many of these? It doesn't talk a lot about some of these things, yes, but then there's all their con contrary scriptures, which can be said to point against it, and they all use these things. So that's what I've seen, too. I've been preaching this for a long time. I've been saying that the Catholic Church is not against gay, gay people, per se, people of a homosexual orientation. It's not against that. It's just for marriage. We believe that marriage is for one man and one woman, not 
So we're not trying to condemn two people who truly love each other. We're just saying that two people who truly love each other is not marriage, just as seven people or 10 people is not, or a man and their animal or family members or parents and children or any of the other things that people want to change to make marriage. We're just saying that we can't change what marriage is because God himself made it. And we don't have the authority, even if we wanted to. And I think that was your, your point in the book is that this is the authority that the Catholic Church preaches with, is that we preach with authority because it comes down from Jesus Christ, who is Almighty God himself. It does not matter our personal opinion. It's what matters that's come down from Christianity from the earliest days and from Christ. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And it's not, it's not only that we can't change um, what, you know, we can't change what God said, we can't change what love is, but we also can't change, I would just add to the end of your uh, excellent talk there, that we can't change what people are, right? So it's not like, we. yes, we can't change what marriage is, but that's because we can't change what people are. And so I think actually that like the transgender thing, which I've been, you know, immersed in for the last couple of years, because I've been making this movie, um, is, is actually helpful in this situation. So there is no such thing as a trans kid. There just isn't. Right. They don't exist. Okay. But that also, when you explain, when you understand why that is, that nobody's born in the wrong body, that you are not the equivalent of your desires, that that's not who you are, that you can have desires that don't match up with your body, that this that we used to treat these things as mental disorders. If you had ideas that didn't match up with reality, we would treat them. All of those same arguments that everybody is using rightfully against medicalizing trans kids can be used against the whole notion of homosexuality. There's no such thing as a trans kid. There's no such thing as a gay kid. There's no such thing as a homo. There's no such thing as a homosexual orientation. If that's what you by that, you mean identity. No, that's not your identity. (laughs) That's not who you are. Okay. Yes, we can have desires. Absolutely. For good or for bad but that's not who we are. And so this um, this is what the Catholic Church provides uh, is, and I tell people this, like, yes, the Catholic Church is the authority, but it's not an arbitrary authority. It is one that is just wants you to line up with reality because that's good and true and beautiful. <laughs> like, we want you to flourish. We want you to live in accordance with what is best for you. That is what the church offers. It's it's not offering like, oh, you're going to lose all your fun. It's like, no. Have you seen the end result of what society gives us right now? Pain, suffering, loneliness, depression, um, divorce, uh, addic- addiction, divorce, broken. F- it's horrendous. The Catholic Church offers you an alternative. <laughs> That's what we're saying. It's good and true and beautiful. So, and I might yeah, throw I, in there if I could add on an addendum to that. I might throw in that there's so many Catholics who are divorced, hurting, broken because mm-hmm. they. It's the people who don't follow their own church. And don't do it the way the church has taught, but follow the way of the world, just as Protestantism has, which has led to this fallout. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, I thought it was very interesting that you said the YMCA, one of the biggest Christian organizations, was one of the first things to promote. Sorry about that. Was one of the first things to promote um, Margaret Sanger and her uh, her kind of racist uh, terminology, her uh, wanting to get birth control. J- John Rockefeller was a huge advocate of birth control. He pretty much almost, him and Ford and a couple others almost single-handed, they funded the entire movement of which it probably wouldn't have stood. And how did he? Because he was part of a pastor uh, of a church that was just immense in this kind of doctrine and promoting Darwinianism and uh, really kind of a racist propaganda. And he received that, endorsed it, and then endorsed Margaret Sanger. So you see how just yeah. the crack in what the apostles taught, the crack in the theology, a crack in what Jesus taught us leads to destruction, twisted unto destruction. So people, if you haven't got this book already and you haven't clicked um, the uh, the Amazon link or Catholic Answers, Catholic.com, Please check out Twisted Under Destruction. It is a fantastic book. And there's so much more information in the book that we could never give in a overly long interview like this. But I I really highly recommend the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a lot. And I think it is a huge bomb on Protestantism and a bomb on really the Bible alone and shows that the Bible alone destroyed Christianity 
uh, our culture and the world. So I want to thank you, Don, for um, allowing us to have this interview with you to, you know, showcase your book. And I want to thank you for writing and really bringing this truth. And I pray that people's eyes are open and it helps to bring people back to the truth that will set them free. Well, I appreciate it, Brian. And I, thanks for having me on. It's great to talk to you and just keep up the good fight. You're doing an amazing job. Thank you so much. And I would love to have you back in the future. Maybe we could talk about some of those trans topics or yeah, something definitely. like that, because those are very interesting. And I love to hit those topics, too. Yeah, definitely. Love to do that. All right. God bless. And thank you for joining us. And thank you all for joining us as well. Please see our description uh, section notes below. We will put his book down below along with some of his movies that he's done. We will link those all below. Then we would ask you to support our ministry because um, this probably will not be monetized due to the uh, content of it. Uh, apparently, we speak the truth and the truth is not welcome in the world. So if you are still watching, please consider supporting this ministry so we can keep doing the work we're doing. And please follow us on social media below and check out our website at thecatholictruth.org. If you would like a speaker, a parish mission leader, apologetic seminars, merchandise, or anything else. Thank you all for watching. God bless you. And we are always praying for you.